Hey, welcome to Lesson 1, Applicable Regulations for the FAA Part 107 Exam Prep. This will be everything you need to know to pass Part 107 throughout all 12 lessons. And let's begin with applicable regulations. This will relate to small unmanned aircraft system rating privileges, limitations, and flight. So according to Title 14 of the Code of Federal Regulations Part 107, to apply for a remote pilot certificate with an SUAS rating, you must satisfy the following eligibility requirements. You must, of course, pass the initial aeronautical knowledge test at an FAA-approved knowledge testing center. You must be at least 16 years of age or older. You must be in physical and mental condition that would not interfere with the safe operation of an SUAS but the FAA does not require you to submit a medical certificate. You must also be able to read, write, and understand the English language. And again, the FAA may also make exceptions for some medical reasons. And you must pass a background check by the Transportation Security Administration, the TSA. And this background check is performed automatically with your application to the FAA. And again, if you fail the exam, you must wait a full 14 days before you're allowed to retake the exam. Now, throughout all of these lessons, we'll be referring to small unmanned aircraft systems as small unmanned aircraft systems, unmanned aircraft system, an SUAS, a UAS, a UA, also aircraft. Um, this lesson will pertain to the operation of certain civil small unmanned aircraft within the National Aeronautical System, the NAS. A civil small unmanned aircraft must meet the following criteria. So it must weigh less than 55 pounds, including everything on board or otherwise detached to the aircraft. That includes uh, any extra cameras or payloads. And it must be operated without the possibility of direct human intervention from within or on the aircraft. It must be registered with the FAA according to Title 14, Code of Federal Regulations, Part 48. And it must be registered if it weighs between 0.55 pounds and 55 pounds. And that's not 55 pounds or less, but less than 55 pounds. That's a pretty big drone, I'll just tell you that. The one in the picture here weighs about three and a half to five pounds. So these things can obviously get pretty big. You must also be at least 13 years of age or older to register an SUAS. Now, if the owner is less than 13, that UA must be registered by a person who is at least 13 years of age or older. Now, Part 107 does not apply to the following. It does not apply to amateur rockets moored balloons or unmanned free balloons, kites, public aircraft operations, and I'll stress that public aircraft operations, there'll be some questions regarding that, operations conducted outside of the United States, or air carrier operations. Now, also in accordance with Part 101, Subpart E of the Model Aircraft Rules, Part 107 basically does not apply to model aircraft that are flown strictly for hobby or recreational use. Now, also according to Title 14 CFR Part 48, before operating your unmanned aircraft, you must mark it to identify that it is registered with the FAA. And this applies to both the hobbyist and commercial UA operators. Now the number must be legible and durable, so you, it needs to be either applied by a permanent marker or self-adhesive label, and the number must also be visible and accessible without the use of tools. So the FAA permits that it can be inside, the number can be inside a battery compartment, but that battery compartment must be, you must be able to open it without the use of tools uh, in case the FAA or administrator um, performs a surprise inspection on you, which can happen. Now, we, we're not affili affiliated with this company, but we found um, ReclaimDrone.com. They, um, they offer a great variety of printed stickers that will professionally display your FAA registration number on your uh, unmanned aircraft. The cost is around six to 10 bucks, and it's a great option to keep your registration markings looking professional and clean. 
And they also include a, a card as well to carry around in your wallet. Um, great opportunity, great deal. Now, if your small unmanned aircraft is registered in a foreign country, or if your UA is owned, controlled, or operated by somebody, somebody who is not a US citizen, then the remote pilot in command must obtain a foreign aircraft permit before conducting any commercial operations. Recertification requirements and change of address, remote pilots must renew their Part 107 certification every two years by taking another exam at an authorized CATS or PSI testing center. The cost will be whatever the applicable cost is at that time. Currently in 2018, it's $150. Remote pilots must also notify the FAA of address changes within 30 days. And a lot of this information, a lot of these address changes and requests can all be done at the FAA new website at the uh, FAA drone zone .faa .gov. It's a great resource and uh, we hi highly advise going there anytime to familiarize yourself with that site. Now, an FAA airworthiness certification for your unmanned aircraft is not required before operation. And, and that means basically is that the FAA does not require to inspect your drone before flight. Now, however, with that said, the remote pilot in command must maintain and inspect their drone prior to each flight to ensure that it is in a safe condition for safe operation. So the FAA is putting all the responsibility on the remote pilot in command, and you'll see that throughout all of these lessons. Now the FAA typically requires that owners follow, follow their uh, manufacturer's guidelines as to what is safe and unsafe. However, we found that many manufacturers of drones do not provide a maintenance procedure or checklist. So when no guidelines are provided, the FAA highly suggests you keep a journal of maintenance and repairs, and a flight log is highly recommended. Now, the remote pilot in command is required to report accidents to the FAA within 10 days following a serious accident to a person or damage to property in excess of $500, excluding your small unmanned aircraft system. Now, the FAA defines serious injury to a person such as loss of consciousness, broken bones, skin lacerations that require stitches. The physical damage aspect must be reported if the cost to replace a repair is more than $500, again, not including the cost of the repairs to the uh, unmanned aircraft. So for example, if an $800 uh, awning on a home is damaged, you accidentally crashed your drone into it, but the cost to repair is only $400, then the accident does not have to be reported to the FAA. Now there's pilot in command requirements. The oper when a, a pilot in command is operating their drone, it may involve one or more individuals, a team or crew members, which can consist of the remote pilot in command, a different person who is manipulating the remote controls, and a third or fourth or fifth person who persons who could be the visual observers. So the remote pilot in command is the person who holds a current remote pilot certificate with an SUAS rating, and they have the final authority and responsibility for the operation and safety of the unmanned aircraft system. The person manipulating the controls must be at all times under the direct supervision of the remote pilot in command. They do not have to hold a Part 107 certification. The visual observer may be a person acting as a flight crew member to help see and avoid air traffic or other objects in the sky overhead or on the ground just um, for situational awareness and, and, and a safer flight operation. So the remote pilot in command must be designated before each flight, but that can change during the flight, provided the remote pilot can ensure the operation poses no undue hazard to people 
aircraft or property. Now in the event of loss of control of an aircraft for any reason, the remote pilot in command must of course comply with all applicable regulations of Part 107. Now again, a non-certified person may operate the SUAS commercially, may operate the controls only if he or she is under the direct supervision of the remote pilot in command. And the remote pilot in command must have the ability to take direct control of the SUAS. So they must be pretty close to that person manipulating the, uh, operating the remote control. So of course the use of a person manipulating the remote control is optional as well as visual observers. The role of the visual observer again is to alert the rest of the crew about potential hazards during an unmanned aircraft operation. So again, the use of a visual observer or a VO uh, is optional and the remote pilot in command may use one or more to supplement situational awareness and visual line of sight responsibility while perhaps the remote pilot in command is conducting other mission critical duties. The remote pilot in command must make certain that all visual observers are positioned in a location where, where they are able to see the unmanned aircraft continuously and sufficiently to maintain visual line of sight while retaining a means to effectively communicate the unmanned aircraft position and the position of other aircraft to the remote pilot in command and person manipulating the controls. No, that sounds like a mouthful and a whole lot, but once you get into becoming certified, again, the limits, it's pretty unlimited what type of business you can get into. It can be something as simple as taking photographs for a real estate agent, or you can get up into something as big and as serious as inspecting cell towers, or even crop dusting. It is a wide open field and that's why we're so excited about it. Part 107 permits the transfer of control of the SUAS between two or more certified remote pilot in commands. However, the transfer must be accomplished while maintaining visual line of sight of the drone and without loss of control of that drone. Now, Part 107 prohibits the operation of a small unmanned aircraft system at night commercially between the end of evening civil twilight and the beginning of morning civil twilight. Now, in the contiguous United States, evening civil twilight is the period of sunset until 30 minutes after sunset, and morning civil twilight is the period of 30 minutes prior to sunrise. In Alaska, the definition of civil twilight uh, differs and is described in the Federal Air Almanac. Now, when uh, an SUAS operations are conducted during civil twilight, that unmanned aircraft must be equipped with the anti-collision lights that are capable of being visible for at least three statute miles. So Part 107 permits the remote pilot to reduce the intensity of this lighting if he or she has determined it would be in the interest of the operational safety to do so. So a commercial drone operator is restricted really to flying in daylight hours only unless that unmanned aircraft has anti-collision lights installed. A small unmanned aircraft must remain within visual line of sight, VLOS, and I'll add here, you're going to see a lot more acronyms. So get used to memorizing and learning some of them, which you will, it'll, it'll come second nature, but a small unmanned aircraft must always remain within visual line of sight of flight crew members unaided by any device other than eyeglasses, corrective lenses, minimum visibility as observed from the location of the control station must be no less than three statute miles want to add here that the minimum distance from clouds, you must fly your drone and minimum distance must be no less than 500 feet below a cloud and 2000 feet horizontally from that cloud. And crew members must also be able to see a small unmanned aircraft at all times during the flight as well. When we get into a little bit about the weather um, in a later lesson, we'll understand how this 500 feet below cloud rule is uh, pretty important applicable especially with ground fog. 
Now again, visual line of sight must be accomplished and maintained by unaided visions, as we said. Now accept the vision by corrective lenses or eyeglasses. Vision aids such as binoculars may be used, but only to momentarily enhance situational awareness, such as to avoid flying over persons or to avoid conflicting with other aircraft. So remember the key word regarding binocular use is momentarily. There'll be some trick questions, or there may be, on your final FAA exam. Um, so remember that. Um, regaining your visual line of sight, um, if the remote pilot in command or person manipulating the controls has a, have a brief moment when they're not looking directly at or cannot see the small unmanned aircraft, but still retains the capability to see it quickly again or be able to maneuver it back to line of sight, that's okay. It's just that these moments should only be used briefly for the safety of the op operation, such as briefly looking down at the control station or, or scanning the airspace. Um, and to scan for traffic in the sky, the crew or remote pilot in command should systematically focus on different segments of the sky for short intervals. Uh, operational necessity, such as to intentionally maneuver the aircraft for a brief period behind an obstruction. There is no specific time or interval for which interruption of visual contact is permissible. The FAA is leaving it up to the remote pilot in command as they are the ones responsible um, as to maintain situational awareness and safety throughout an entire flight operation. Now the FAA provides some scanning techniques that they recommend. So to scan effectively, they recommend pilots look from the right to the left or the left to the right, that they should begin scanning at the greatest distance an object can be perceived, which is the top in this image here in this graphic, and then move inward toward the position of towards the aircraft toward the bottom. Now for each stop of visual scanning, an area approximately 30 degrees wide should be scanned. The duration of each stop is based on the degree of detail that is required, but no stop really should last longer than two to three seconds. So you're just kind of scanning and panning the sky, situational awareness, looking out, always being aware. So again, looking at this graph, you might start in the upper left side at the number one, scan 30 degrees of airspace left to right, then back looking at your unmanned aircraft. And then when moving from one viewing point to the next, the remote pilot should overlap the previous field of view by 10 degrees or so, and continue scanning the airspace in the next quadrant and so on. So it's, it's just a good idea, situational awareness, scanning the skies, and, and I also add, it's also a good idea to pay attention to what you hear as well, because you'll, you'll likely hear if you're near an airport by any degree, and most of us are, will be, you'll hear airplanes coming in. It'll be a little intimidating. They're typically two to 3,000 feet above you. But again, situational awareness and scanning of the skies. Now the operation limits for a small unmanned aircraft, there, there's a few. Um, your small unmanned aircraft cannot be flown faster than a ground speed of 100 miles per hour or 87 knots. That's pretty fast. The drone also cannot be flown higher than 400 feet above ground level, AGL. Now, unless it's flown within a 400 foot radius of a structure, such as a building or cell tower, then you may fly 400 feet above the uppermost top of that structure. Your drone cannot be flown lower than 2000 feet above ground level over national parks, national monuments, recreational areas, and locations administered by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the U.S. Forest Service. Now, basically, one is not permitted to fly at all within a national park or monument without prior authorization. And we'll get into some waivers later on, which are one of some of the most common waivers requested through the FAA uh, to fly in national parks. 
and flying at night. But as mentioned, when flying your um, unmanned aircraft above a structure's uppermost limit, the aircraft must remain within a 400-foot radius of that structure. Such as if you're inspecting in this graph here, this cell tower, if it's 1,600 feet tall, you may fly up to 400 feet above that. I'm going to add there, providing you're not going into any controlled airspace, which we will be reviewing in the next two lessons. If the structure, if a communications tower has guy wires sticking out, protruding out from the side of it, which they can go out quite a, quite a long ways, um, the FAA recommends that the remote pilot in command fly no closer than 2,000 feet horizontally to that structure. That's a recommendation. There is nothing, there's no law or rule that states you cannot fly closer. Remember that because there may be a trick question regarding that. Now, no person may operate a small unmanned aircraft in a manner that interferes with the operation and traffic patterns at any airport, helioport, or seaplane base. Now, the, again, the remote pilot in command has the sole responsibility to remain clear of and yield right away to, to all other aircraft, manned or unmanned, and to avoid other potential hazards that may affect the remote pilot in command's operation of the aircraft. Now, in doing all this, as we previously mentioned, scanning the skies and all that, it is all traditionally referred to as see and avoid. To satisfy this responsibility, the remote pilot in command must be aware of all other aircraft, persons, and property in the vicinity of the operating area. They must know the location and flight path of his or her small unmanned aircraft at all times. You must be able to maneuver the unmanned aircraft to avoid collision and prevent other aircraft from having to take evasive action. That would not be a good day. You want to avoid operating anywhere where the presence of his or her unmanned aircraft may interfere with the operations at an airport, such as approach corridors, taxiways, runways, or heliopads. And you must yield the right of way to all other aircraft, including aircraft operating on the surface of an airport, at such as a taxiway. Yes, the FAA wants you to know that. Now, you may not commercially operate your unmanned aircraft directly over another person unless that person is directly involved in the operation of your flight operation, such as a visual observer or other crew member. Now, remember, this is commercially. You cannot operate your SUAS over another person unless they're within safe cover such as inside a stationary vehicle or a protective structure that would protect that person. And to comply with limitations on the unmanned aircraft operations near persons not participating in an operation, the remote pilot in, com um, excuse me, in command should employ strategies that protect the people uninvolved with the flight. Now, this would be such as select an appropriate operational area for the flight, ideally, you know, as an operational area, site area that is sparsely populated. Um, you know, if you're going to be flying near a, a school or a public school, you know, kind of inspect it the day or two before just to see when there may be more people around the area or not. Now, if operating in populated areas, make a plan to keep non-participants clear, indoor, or undercover. Now, sometimes that can be challenging, but again, it is the remote pilot in command's responsibility to ensure the safety of everyone. Now, if operating your SUAS from a moving vehicle, you must choose a sparsely populated or unpopulated area and make a plan to keep your unmanned aircraft clear of anyone who may approach and just adopt an appropriate operating distance from non-participants and take reasonable precautions to keep the operational area free of non-participants. Now, part 107 does permit you to operate your unmanned aircraft from a moving land vehicle or waterborne vehicle over sparsely populated or unpopulated areas only. Moving 
operating your SUAS, excuse me, um, from a moving aircraft is totally prohibited. Now, operations from moving vehicles are subject to the same restrictions that apply to all other parts of Part 107. You know, the remote pilot in, in command, the person manipulating the controls, everyone must still maintain visual line of sight of the unmanned aircraft. And operations over persons not directly involved in the operation of the unmanned aircraft, unless under safe cover, are still prohibited. And the visual observer, the VO, and remote pilot must still maintain effective communication. Careless or reckless operation of the SUAS is still prohibited. And operating an SUAS while driving a moving vehicle is considered to be careless or reckless because the driver's attention would be hazardously divided. That's understandable. So therefore, the driver or operator of the land or waterborne vehicle must not serve as the remote pilot in command, must not serve as the person manipulating controls, and cannot be a visual observer. Now, under Part 107, it's permissible for the remote pilot to be a passenger in a moving vehicle operating an SUAS, and the driver does not have to be a crew member. And I guess it goes without saying, no flying while intoxicated. Um, the remote pilot in command, person manipulating the controls, visual observer, all of them may not perform operations while under the influence of drugs or alcohol. And this also includes certain over-the-counter medications, such as, um, such as certain antihistamines, decongestants. So a person may not serve as any unmanned aircraft crew member if he or she has consumed any alcohol beverage within the preceding eight hours, is currently under the influence of alcohol, has a blood alcohol concentration of 0.04% or greater, and remember that, is using a drug that affects the person's mental or physical abilities, and how long does it take for one drink or beer to pass through someone's system three hours. And why do we mention that? Because it may be on your test. Now, as you can imagine, the FAA takes DUI and drug offenses pretty seriously. So if you are convicted of an alcohol or drug related offense, pilots, remote pilots can face license or certification suspension for up to one year from the date of conviction. Now, in addition, refusal to submit to an alcohol or drug test can also result in revocation of your license or certificate from the date of refusal. Now, you know, while the FAA cannot and does not administer alcohol or drug tests di directly, refusing a test from a law enforcement officer can result in the same outcome. Overall, um, the cardinal rule is with man pilots, they say eight hours from bottle to throttle if you do partake. Now, Part 107 includes an option to apply for Certificate of Waivers, which allows the SUAS operator to deviate from certain provisions of Part 107 if the FAA administrator finds that the proposed operation can be safely conducted under the terms of the submitted Certificate of Waiver, the COW. Now, a list of waivable sections are operation from a moving vehicle or aircraft. However, no waiver of this provision will be issued to allow the carriage of property of another by aircraft for compensation or hire. Daylight operation, that is the request to operate at night, and that is one of the most requested waivers. Visual line of sight operation. Again, however, no waiver of this provision will be issued to allow the carriage of property of another by aircraft for compensation for hire. Visual observer or observers. Operation of multiple small unmanned aircraft systems. Yielding the right away. Operation over people. Operation in certain airspace. Now, it's not the same as controlled airspace. We'll get into some waivers 
um, later on in some of the lessons and show you where you apply uh, for a waiver, which is through the FAA Drone Zone website. And we'll also show you how you can see uh, some examples of waivers and um, some waivers that are recently granted. Uh, operation limitations for small unmanned aircraft as well. So applying for the certificate of waiver, the remote pilot in command can apply for it again at the FAA drone zone.faa.gov website. Follow the instructions. It's pretty simple. And again, um, we're going to uh, provide you with some examples. Uh, the application must contain a complete description of the proposed operation and justification, including supporting data, documentation, so forth, that establishes the proposed operation can safely be conducted under the terms within the COW. Now, although not required by Part 107, the FAA encourages applicants to submit their application at least 90 days prior to the start of the proposed operation. Now, the FAA will strive to complete review and uh, adjudication of waivers within 90 days. We're just seeing that, that they're taking their full 90 days. They're typically backlogged. Um, the time required to, for the FAA to make a final determination, it does vary de depending on the complexity of the request. The amount of data analysis required as part of the application will be proportional to the specific relief that is requested. So. If a COW is eventually granted, and most of the time they are, if it's if the request, request excuse me, is 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 within reason, uh, the certificate will include spe specific special provisions designed to ensure that the SUAS operation may be conducted as safely as one conducted under the, under the provisions of Part 107. So, real life examples again can be reviewed on the FAA website. We've uh, posted the link here, waivers granted. Um, we'll again also provide links and all downloads at the end of this uh, lesson and at the end of the entire course as well. And again, we'll provide sample letters just so you can get an idea of how these uh, requests are, are written. Government entities or organizations such as public universities, state government, law enforcement agencies, and local manipula uh, municipalities uh, have two op options for operating a small unmanned aircraft system. Now, they can either operate it under Title 14, the Code of Federal Regulations Part 107, or they can obtain a Certificate of Waiver of Authorization, a COA to be allowed to operate their unmanned aircraft in all Class G airspace below 400 feet AGL. Self-certification of the unmanned aircraft pilot, along with the option to obtain an emergency COA under special circumstances. Now, remote pilots must also renew again their uh, certification every two years by taking an exam at an authorized CATS or PSI exam testing center. And again, the cost to review um, and take that exam uh, will be determined at that point in time. Currently, 2018, it's $150. Remote pilots who hold a current Part 107 certification must notify the FAA of the change of their address within 30 calendar days. And we want to point out that failure to do that prohibits the remote pilot in command to commercially operate their drone until the FAA has been notified. So a change in address can easily be submitted online at the FAA Airman Services website. And we'll provide again the links in the final review in Lesson 12. Again, situational awareness. The remote pilot in command attains situational awareness by obtaining as much information as possible prior to the flight and becoming familiar with the performance capabilities of their unmanned aircraft, weather conditions, surrounding airspace, and air traffic control requirements. Now, sources of information, including a weather briefing, air traffic control, FAA, local pilots and landowners are all helpful in obtaining total situational awareness. Now, technology such as global positioning systems, GPS mapping systems, computer applications, we provide some links also for some great apps. 
you know, can assist you as the remote pilot in command as collecting and managing information, again, to improve your situational awareness and risk-based aeronautical decision-making, ADM. Now, one app that provides remote pilots with the ability to check flight conditions, weather, and temporary flight restrictions is hoverapp.io. It's a great little app. So all of these combined, air traffic control, FAA, all lead up to great situational awareness and a safe flight operation. Now, any officer of the FAA administrator is allowed to make any test or inspection of your unmanned aircraft, the remote pilot in command, the visual observer, request to see flight logs or any other documents or records or reports, including asking to see a copy of your remote pilot certificate or any other document as laid out in part 107 without advance notice. So if you're out there flying and somebody walks up to you and flips their ID at you from the FAA, you want to make sure you have all of the applicable documents ready to go. Now, keeping records of any and all scheduled or unscheduled maintenance inspection and repairs is important, as well as maintaining flight records as well. Again, when your SUAS manufacturer does not provide instructions pertaining to scheduled maintenance, the owner, you, you really should create a maintenance log schedule. Uh, there's some flight log books. Again, once again, we'll provide links to that we recommend purchasing. They're cheap, five to 10 bucks. And just keep flight records. Man pilots love to keep records. And it is just as important for a remote pilot in command to do the same. Now, advisory circulars uh, refer to a type of publication offered by the FAA. They're issued to inform the public of non-regulatory material, such as notices or reference materials. Now, these FAA advisory circulars, or ACs, are available to all pilots download from the FAA website. And these circulars are not binding. They're informational. So unless incorporated into a regulation by specific reference, the ACs are organized by subject numbers as follows. So airmen is referred to as AC 60. Anything referring to airspace would be 70. And air traffic and general operating rules would be referred to as 90. Find a way to remember that, memorize it. 60 for airmen. 70 for airspace and 90 for air traffic. There will be questions on the FAA, no doubt. So lastly, here we have falsification, alterations and reproductions. Now the FAA wants you to be honest. So any falsification, reproduction, alteration of records, such as your certificate, your rating, your authorization, your record, or report will not be tolerated by the FAA. Uh, it's, an, it's an instant revocation, basically, just be honest. No person may make or cause to be made any fraudulent or intentional false record or report that is required to be made, kept, or used to show compliance with any requirement under this part. Any re reproduction or alteration for fraudulent, excuse me, fraudulent purpose of any certificate, rating, authorization, record, or report. Engaging in any of this activity can result in denial of an application for a remote pilot certificate, denial for certificate of waiver, suspension or revocation of certificate of waiver issued by the administrator, or even a civil penalty. So just be honest, folks, and you'll do fine. Let's move on to some uh, questions and answers. Now, according to Title 14, Code of Federal Regulations, Part 107, an SUAS is an unmanned aircraft system weighing, was it 55 pounds or less, between 0.55 pounds and 55 pounds or less than 55 pounds? And this is one of those more truer answers where there's two correct answers like to start it right out of the gate. The FAA can give you these kind of questions on their uh, actual final exam. 
um, less than 55 pounds would be true between 0.55 pounds and 55 pounds between would be more correct of an answer. During your pre-flight inspection, you discover a small nick in the casing of your drone battery. What action should you take? Now, did we talk about batteries? No, but we did talk about maintaining flight logs and following manufacturer's guidance. Did I give that answer away? I think I did. So just follow your manufacturer's guidelines or guidance. Now, a person without a Part 107 remote pilot certificate may operate an unmanned aircraft for commercial business use, providing a visual observer is present, you have a waiver from the FAA, or the person is under the direct supervision of the remote pilot in command. And that would be under the direct supervision of the remote pilot in command. Now, which of the following operations are regulated under Title 14 CFR Part 107? Flying your drone as a recreational hobby? We know that's not true. Conducting public operations during a search mission? Or taking pictures with your unmanned aircraft for a construction company? Public operations is not the answer because public operations does not pertain to part 107. You accidentally crashed your drone into a car that resulted in more than $500 in damage. I feel bad for you. But when must you report this to the FAA? You don't because there wasn't more than $1,000 in damage within 10 calendar days or within 10 business days? Well, the FAA says within 10 days. So that would be calendar days. That's not a lot of time in my opinion. According to part 107, what is required to operate your SUAS within 30 minutes after official sunset? Remember those anti-collision lights you have to have? And they got to be visible within three statute miles as well. According to Title 14 CFR Part 48, when must a person register a small unmanned aircraft with the FAA? When the UA is used for any purpose other than as a model aircraft? Only when the remote pilot in command will be paid for commercial services. Or when the small UA weighs greater than 0.55 pounds, regardless of intended use. When months the person register? It is regardless of use. Everyone must register their drone if it weighs more than 0.55 pounds. They don't care that you have to register your micro drone, um, just larger drones, over a half a pound, basically. So what is the minimum age required to apply for a Part 107 remote pilot certificate? Must you be 13 years of age or older, 16 years of age or older, or any age? Well, it was 16 years of age or older. You must be at least 13 years of age to register your drone with the FAA. When are you allowed to part, uh, operate, excuse me, your drone from a moving vehicle? When operating over a parade or other social event, when operating over suburban areas, remember it was when flying over sparsely populated areas only. Last set of questions. You've been hired to inspect the top of a 1,275 foot tall cell tower. No guy wires, it's just one tall tower. How high are you legally allowed to fly? Well, remember you can fly 400 feet above that tower. So it would be up to 1,675 feet AGL above ground level providing you remain within a 400 foot radius of that tower. 
And also according to part 107, how often is a remote pilot required to take the recurrent aeronautical knowledge exam? Every two years. We all have to take it. Every two years you want to maintain that part 107 certification. And you can always come back here and learn it for life now that you are a lifetime member of the drone coach. Now, when you apply for your part 107 remote pilot certificate, which division will conduct your background check? Is it the FAA or the DEA or the TSA? Remember, it's the Transportation Security Administration as that background check is automatically performed when you apply for your FAA certification after you pass the test, which you will do. All right, coffee break. Good job and congratulations on completing lesson one. Feel free to take a break. The next two chapters, we're going to cover airspace classes, and I feel next to the weather lesson, uh, it's the most complex lessons we will learn. It involves airspace, controlled and non-controlled. It's not really difficult. It's just a lot of symbols and charts to study. Appreciate your time and let's move on.